This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This week on Off the Record, another big employer with another big announcement for Charlotte, why Lowe's is bringing 1,600 new jobs to South End. How loud is too loud? How close is too close? City Council limits noisy protests near a Charlotte abortion clinic. The police chief wonders why dangerous suspects who should be in jail are on the streets instead wearing electronic monitoring devices. North Carolina's congressional districts might not be fair, but they are legal. That's what the U.S. Supreme Court says. And that $50 million Mecklenburg tax increase with half of the money going to the arts. So will it be on the ballot in November or not? Off the records next on PBS Charlotte. Hi, I'm Jeff Sonier. This is Off the Record, where we talk about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, or listen to the news, you'll recognize the names and faces around our table. Mark Garrison from WBT Radio and Mark Becker from WSOC-TV. Thank you for joining us. Also, Eli Portillo from the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute and Ashley Fahey from the Charlotte Business Journal. Thank you for joining us. Thank you also for being with us at home. You can join our conversation anytime. Just email your questions and comments to Off the Record at WTBI.org. And welcome again to our Facebook Live audience. You can comment, you can like us, you can share our Facebook posts. We're just glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> well, uh, the announcement that came uh, yesterday on, on the, the, the Lowe's expansion into South End Charlotte was huge for a lot of different reasons. But let's start first with just the pure numbers. I, I called it 1,600 new jobs. That's mm -hmm. almost underselling it a little bit, isn't it? Well, so it's um, by the state's measure, it's 1,600 new jobs for the state of North Carolina, but there's um, three to 400 that will likely relocate from Mooresville, which is where Lowe's is headquartered um, over the, the next several years. So 2,000 jobs mm -hmm. coming to the South End Coming to South End, and right. they're kicking off a new tower that they will 100% lease. Yeah, how important is this particular job announcement when it comes to not just uh, economic development, but just upward mobility and all the other things that we've been talking about so much. Well, I talked to some of the council members, including um, you know Tarek Bakari and James Mitchell, who heads the Economic Development Committee, and apparently there was some um, uh, uh, concern, I guess, that um, adding so many six-figure salaries, because the average median wage is about eight, eight, $118,000 um, wow. per job, right, um, would actually um, worsen the economic mobility challenges. Huh. Um, but I think Lowe's has committed to doing some workforce um, development initiatives, um, kind of working with different different members of the community on, yeah. on workforce development, because that's the thing they kept talking about yesterday is we have to be able to hire for these jobs. We have to be able to fulfill this. They're like, we're going to start hiring today for this mm -hmm. for this center. Yeah, I mean, jobs that average $118,000 a year, where we sign up, first mm -hmm. of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, and again, the, the boost not just to the Charlotte region, because a lot of times you see these places like Amazon coming in and, and, and establishing large you know, new developments and the suburban areas, but coming into the center city, I think that's just, that's different. That's, that's, um, that's significant, I think, in terms of what the city's trying to do and, and what the city now maybe represents to um, headquarters and, and other corporate entities. You know, and sort you, of you put it in, a, in, in context of Charlotte in the, the development, some of the things that have happened, we had the truest, which is to say uh, SunTrust <laughs> and BB&T, sort of <laughs> the truest tr bank, but, you know, fall into our laps, really, as mm -hmm. it were. And right. this one, of course, there was a little more working behind the scenes mm -hmm. and some incentives you're saying offered. Uh, but but still, this is it's like free money, really, for the city in, in, in terms of development and, and where we're going. Um, and, you know, maybe makes up a little bit for the Panthers moving their headquarters. Yeah. And, and I would argue that it's probably... If you had to choose one or the other in terms of economic development and, and, and so forth, big impact, this clearly has a lot more impact than if we had thrown some major incentives at, yeah. at uh, David Tepper and the mm -hmm. Panthers, right? Yeah. That, that's sort mm -hmm. of a big headline mm -hmm. and feel good yeah. kind of thing. But this is really, I think, significant impact. No, I think so. It, it is significant too. And Charlotte has had this, um, I guess, this reckoning with, are we <coughs> a, a tech center? Are, are we able to attract these technology jobs? Amazon.com supposedly said no to Charlotte because of you know, mm -hmm. a lack of tech jobs currently here. But um, Charlotte's really, especially with its shift in economic development, has been trying to attract 
those kinds of positions. So, um, you know, I think so, everyone's pretty excited about it um, and, and curious to see what kind of impact it will have. Now, Dallas was the city we we, uh, we overcame to, to win this project, and I was reading the Dallas paper, and they to pointed clear, out Dallas, that, Texas, uh, not Dallas, Texas, not Dallas, Texas. He almost had to, right? Dallas, Texas, and the, the Dallas papers pointed out that their pool of tech workers is far larger than our Absolutely. pool of tech workers, mm -hmm. but I guess ours is big enough. And in particular, I guess, when you're dealing with a firm that, while it has most of its doors, its biggest presence in Texas, its mm -hmm. headquarters is in Mooresville, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, we, you know, we are a competitor for any company that's looking for tech jobs, but in particular, the ones that have a, an obvious connection to Charlotte or the Carolinas, you know, I, I would think that you know, this is this is a big win for us. I would think in a lot of ways. Yeah, and you're seeing a, a lot of companies um, establish these sorts of hubs, not directly in Uptown Charlotte, but in the areas right around mm -hmm. it. Uh, Duke Energy is establishing their innovation center in Optimist uh, Hall, which is an old mill that's being converted. Mm -hmm. EY Ernst and Young is establishing um, an innovation center in South End. I believe it's called Wave Space in another new building. So you're starting to see a lot of these uh, right around downtown Charlotte right in the core. Mm -hmm. And also I think the fact that Lowe's chose to come to South End and not build a new campus out in the suburbs mm -hmm. uh, is also significant for Charlotte's development because 2,000 jobs, you know, in the past, something that large might have gone to uh, a Ballantine or sure. a new mm -hmm. office park. And you're starting to see um, a lot of these really cluster around Uptown, around the light rail line, around mm -hmm. the uh, places where the city's been hoping to funnel development. Right. And I think that's significant for the city's growth as well. And the problem with Uptown and Ballantyne is there's no craft breweries, right? <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, it, it's, it's laughable on some level, but at the same time, this is the, you know, they, they kind of go together, the innovative, uh, you know, mm -hmm. tech jobs. And those young folk like what, their beers? craft beers. <laughs> I but think so. <laughs> but this is why you're seeing, you know, Valentine's right. doing this massive reimagining. I mean, they're going to be spending yeah. a lot of money on infrastructure, mm -hmm. on new development. They're doing away with a golf course. I mean, this is why they're doing that. This is why they're pushing for light rail. Are they trying to become more like They want to be competitive. End? They wow. just want to be more competitive yeah. because, you know, like like Eli said, um, a 2,000 job center yeah. typically would have gone to a place like Valentine, and now they're all picking South yeah. End and Uptown. And let, let's, let's take a moment to talk about the investment that the city made a decade or more ago in the South End area in terms of the light rail line itself. There were a lot of critics, a lot of folks who said this is I'm not something we that. need. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. something that's going to boost development that we might not get otherwise. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's very much the plans that, that people saw back in the, you know, when they were establishing light rail are, are coming to fruition now. This is exactly yeah. what the light rail supporters talked about when they, they supported light rail in the first place. And then mayor and McCoy. since governor yeah. pat mccrory was one out front of, you know as a republican i mean the, he caught a lot of heat from citizens for effective government mm -hmm. uh don reed and some of those folks on the on the right side oh, yeah. of the republican called it a boondoggle and and really questioned it right up to the end remember there was this whole repeal the 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 the, the, the tax right. that was uh, mm -hmm. set aside and and you know the, the the argument was made some people know the cost of everything but don't know the real long-term value well i think the light rail has proven yeah, that it you know there there is some wisdom there. Kind of ironic that Governor Cooper is there for the announcement, you know, reaping the benefits of the framework that was laid by his political rival back when he was mayor. You know, One a thing or more ago. that I thought was interesting, uh, looking at the rendering of the new building, was the angle it's shown from is very nice, shiny glass, brick, etc. On the back of that building, there's a huge parking deck, mm -hmm. <laughs> which you can see peeking out around the render. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be very interested to see how many of these 2,000 workers are taking the light yeah. rail versus how many are driving to that parking deck because light rail is a, a big economic development tool. It is not necessarily proven to be as successful at actually moving people. Oh, you're right, tool. because all of the numbers, even out to uh, UNCC now, yeah. are way below the projections they, they had of who yeah. would ride the thing. And yeah. I guess you, you could say, well, these are the kinds of projects that could boost ridership, but heck, if you can't boost ridership with what you've already got uptown, then I mean, is, is this really going to significantly change that? That being said, as the city changes, if you've ever driven through South End certain times of the day, 
you might want to get on that light rail train instead of driving. You can't it drive. Well, when you have 5,000 5, new workers with all these other <laughs> yeah, projects, exactly. those roads are about to get they really get clogged. Really clogged. Yeah. The, the growth is a, is a problem that you like to have, and so I guess no one's going to complain too much about traffic for now. Well, at they least, will eventually. But, a, but a very big deal, and like I said, a win for the city after a lot of perceived losses to right. other places and other projects and that sort of thing. So I guess that's good news. Um, the city council talked a lot about the noise ordinance this week, but it was what they didn't talk about so much and what the, the people who came to the hearing talked about that really is the center of this story. City Council changing the noise ordinance, but those changes appear to be aimed particularly at protesters and maybe a specific group of protesters at outside a, a specific Charlotte abortion clinic. Anybody well, want to take that first? It was aimed at uh, the protesters on Latrobe Drive sure. uh, who were there six days a week. Cities for Life is one of the lead groups. Uh, they couched it in language of a quiet zone around hospitals and schools, but when you pull city records and say who has applied for a permit for amplified sound in the last three years in front of hospitals and schools, you find it's zero. <laughs> the only uh, a, a, a permits for amplified sound has been uh, in front of the abortion clinic. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and it's been loud, and it's been, uh, it's been a problem for the clinic, but you know, here, here's the debate that council had. Uh, are you are you limiting sound? Are you um, limiting what some would call harassment, or are you limiting free speech and First Amendment rights? And, and that's that, that was the debate mm -hmm. among the folks who came to talk about these changes for and against. It really was a surrogate and has been a surrogate argument for the whole you know very deep and divisive issue of pro-life versus mm -hmm. pro-choice. And and if there had been loud people outside a Panthers game, mm -hmm. and there have been, or there have been loud people outside some other venue in other contexts, uh, I don't think we'd be talking about it, right? No. But when those two young ladies got on the table, and by the way, that was an interesting issue too, did the police allow this to happen? Former Governor McCrory and former Mayor McCrory uh, on, on the radio took, took them to task saying this, would, this should never happen. It would never happen, he told me in, in Congress. You know, they'd be tackled before they got up there. Well, police aren't going to tackle a couple of young ladies, right. you yeah. know, who are clearly, you know, unarmed and don't have any threat per se. But it, it wasn't a good visual either. You yeah, know. we haven't seen that at City Council ever. I yeah, started no, to say I for a long time. I've never, never seen, seen that. I've at city never council. seen it there. People yeah. standing on the day, standing on the desk where the, the yeah. council and mayor sit, yeah. holding signs and. And, and, and shouting slogans. Yeah. I, I think we'll probably see a federal lawsuit out of it, and as a big First Amendment proponent, I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. There's a section in that ordinance, uh, amplified sound aside, there's a very vague section in the ordinance that talks about unreasonable sound. Uh, courts typically on First Amendment issues hate a lack of specificity. Mm -hmm. What is unreasonable and who is the arbiter of what is unreasonable? One right. of the guys out there said, hey, well, if I got 50 people singing Amazing Grace in front of the clinic, is that unreasonable? Well, it's mm -hmm. an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know a couple of the pro-life groups are looking at, uh, at suing, and I think that's probably, if I were them, I would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, and I think uh, also it's interesting that given that this passed on an 8-3 eight, eight, vote with uh, both Republican members and Council Member Phipps voting against it, that um, you know this passed by a very comfortable margin despite the protests, despite the mm -hmm. big showing of uh, opposition from pro-life groups. Um, in a more typical election year, I think that this could become an issue for uh, Republicans running for city council at large or for right. mayor mm -hmm. to seize on. You could imagine this being something that they would use to motivate the base. Um, but I don't know if we're going to see that because we have a, a lack of Republicans challenging for mayor and uh, not mm -hmm. seeing a, a big groundswell of at-large candidates either. So I wonder if this is something mm -hmm. that will carry over or kind of fall away until well, there's a lawsuit. I, I kind of view this as you had Julie Iselt and uh, Braxton Winston and Luana Mayfield. They have been promising for more than two years now to do something about Latrobe Drive. Um, in fact, I've got interviews that are two years old with them doing it. Uh, Lawana Mayfield is on video on Latrobe Drive screaming at pro-life protesters. So I see this as their effort to deliver to their base in an election year something that they've been promising to do, and I think mm -hmm. that's exactly what they did. And meanwhile, Republicans kind of asleep at the wheel with uh, other opportunities on their side. To, to drive the base, to get Republican voters out in what is increasingly difficult elections for them locally. Um, a lot of Republicans you hear 
keep focusing on 2020 and the RNC, but this is, we've got a city election in 2019 and, a, and an opposition party, if you will, that doesn't seem fully engaged yet, you know, candidates individually and the party as a whole. I'm, I'm not sure what that says about the Mecklenburg Republican Party. Maybe it's overall weakness given the demographics and all, but still these are issues that you can run on and that candidates have traditionally run on in this city and, and it's just not happening in this particular election year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, by the way, those protesters, interesting, they were not pro-life protesters, the ones that held the sides. No, they were, they were supporting the clinic. Exactly, yeah. but yeah. as they pointed out, I guess with their signs and their slogans and their protests, that this cuts both ways. And a lot of these resistance type protests will also be restricted from using amplified sound or bullhorns if they come to these kinds of locations like churches and, and schools and, and, and medical facilities. And it's also interesting too on this issue of amplified sound, particularly on Latrobe Drive, um, it's kind of an interesting game every day because only one right. permit per day. Mm -hmm. And very often, the clinic gets the permit. Mm -hmm. And they will, I, I mean, we, we ran a piece the other day, they will sometimes blast everything from clips from porn movies in that parking lot, which we have mm -hmm. on tape, to loud music to try to drown out the other side. So it's a, it's a very yeah. interesting game there, and yet, with all of that, uh, business is booming at that clinic. Yeah. Uh, by one estimate, they're doing $4 million worth a year. Yeah, it'll be quieter. Clips I'm not sure if it'll solve movies? the problem. Yeah, good. Somewhat wow. quieter. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the police chief, uh, who seems to be the only person <laughs> talking right now in city government about our crime problem. Um, uh, Mark, you almost hinted yeah. about it in our last show, talking about uh, electronic monitoring devices and some of the concerns in the police department. Yeah. This week, the police chief voiced those concerns loud and clear. So let me step back and, 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 and maybe try to put this in some context. When Kurt Butney took over, um, you know, crime had started to edge back up, violent crime in Charlotte, and it's, I would say, accelerated certainly this year. Mm -hmm. and, and it's gotten to really a, a, a level where it's concerned everyone. We've talked about it a number of times already. And uh, so I think he's feeling a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. He's the guy, you know, the, the buck stops here kind of guy. He's the police chief. And, and he's been out there talking with communities. It's not for lack of effort. He has really, uh, I think he takes it personally. Mm -hmm. Right. And so he's been out talking to groups. He's trying to get, get groups organized. He said, we had a, 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 you know, a forum here where we wanted to get everybody together to talk about what we can do about the violence. And this was a month and a half ago and nobody showed up. Well, nobody, like 50 people showed mm -hmm. up. The usual suspects, mm -hmm. as it were. <laughs> so he gets in and, f and, and, and says, essentially, look, we're arresting more people than we have before, but they're letting them out. And I think what was different about this week was, he essentially named names and mm -hmm. said, you know, the judges are releasing these people uh, on bond, or they're giving them bonds that are too low. And let's be clear, everyone according to the law, except capital murder defendants, is entitled to a bond. Is entitled to a bond. So you can't say, Jeff, you just committed a robbery, you don't get any bond. No, you mm -hmm. have to have a bond. Now, one of the alternatives you can have is to put somebody on electronic monitoring. And that at least if Jeff is out, we know that we can track Jeff. The problem is that won't stop Jeff from doing a lot of he's these doing. crimes lately have been committed right. by people wearing an electronic monitor. So here's and it's hard to get in the minds of judges and so forth. But yes, they almost and I've heard it many times say, if you do get out on bond, Mr. Portillo, you will have an electronic monitor. But that may give a false sense of security. Oh, he's got an EM. Nobody's gonna mm. nobody's gonna gonna mm. you know, he's not gonna do anything. What really set it off though this last weekend, since we talked last, was there was a, a fifteen year old assault. kid yeah. who was on electronic mm. monitoring and you gotta work hard if you're a juvenile to get an electronic monitor. I was told he had a long history yeah, he of did. stuff. All right, so he has an electronic monitor. He allows the battery to go dead, which is a violation. They're looking for him, they can't find him, and boom, he shows up as the suspect in this brutal attack. And, and wasn't there a murder suspect recently yes. that was also wearing exactly an ankle right. bracelet well, yeah. at the time? There are, I'm told, more than 20, 20. Right. people out you know, charged with murder on electronic monitoring. And again, that, that according to the law, is okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it helps on some level, but when these people then reoffend, you're like... See, the issue is the amount of bond. And this is interesting because, and I don't know if if the chief was invited to this party, but we found out that back in January, you had the, the chief magistrate, the chief judge, 
um, and um, uh, the DA and some others sit down, and I've got a 30-page document that they came up with on how to set bail. Without just, new, the new without bail the policy. policy. The new bail right. policy sure. went mm -hmm. into effect in March. I don't think the chief was invited to the hmm. party. No, he was, no, no, wait, wait, wait. There, there's a group called a citizen, uh, citizen uh, yeah. yeah, C but this is a different group, though. But, no, no, he would have been invited to the party because he's a stakeholder. And and uh, um, the police department is absolutely invited to to, to they are but this was a separate meeting from the, from the group you mentioned but the other thing that's interesting about this we just last week got a study from the UNC Institute of Government that acknowledged that yes it is much easier to get bail for a lot of crimes in Charlotte now but that study concluded we don't think there's been a corresponding increase in crimes right. by people who are let out. But the problem is the police chief is going, no, I'm not buying that yeah. study at all. But he sees it firsthand. It's That's not right. a study mm -hmm. for him. It's an everyday occurrence. And it's really interesting because there are movements towards bail reform uh, locally, nationally. It's even been an issue um, at the presidential level. Yeah. And, um, you know, the issue is you can have people who are um, rich and poor charged with the same crime, given the same uh, bond amounts. A wealthier person can pay it and get out. A poor person waits in jail until the trial. So that's been this uh, narrative and sure. dynamic that's right. been discussed a lot, and mm -hmm. that's what uh, people are trying to address it's locally. It's really interesting and almost, um, you know, it's unexpected for me to see the police chief in Charlotte come out so forcefully and say, I think this is a problem and my guys are having, um, you know, having their jobs made harder by this. Yes, and, and, and this has never happened here, where a police chief would have such an orchestrated press conference mm -hmm. that called out judges by name, and then even said, well, he won't return my calls, but I bet he will now, and then that <laughs> afternoon they had a meeting set up for one day next week. All of that, you, you wonder from a political standpoint, too, the police chief reports to the city manager. You wonder if this is the city manager going sick him, or is he going, uh, maybe you need to dial it back a little yeah. bit. You just have to wonder. I don't know what's going on there, but I can tell you that Chief Putney is very frustrated. Yeah, yeah, he, he really is. does mm -hmm. take this personally. You sense that he's talking because no one else is, that he mm -hmm. feels like if no one else is going to step forward and, and, and voice these issues, he's, he's the one that's got to do it. He's not necessarily... Yeah a guy that does this naturally, right. but he's, you kind of no. feel like he's forced other, to do it this the, time. The other thing yeah. that's interesting is he made a big pitch, Mark, you know, for accountability. Public needs to hold mm -hmm. these judges accountable. I, you know, but I don't understand, I don't know what that looks like, uh, because m what most people know about courts, they saw in Law and Order, <laughs> and they don't go to court, and how do you really hold a judge accountable when it's a judgment call right. mm -hmm. on how much bond to give somebody? Yeah. Right. And the other thing that really uh, stood out to me from that was um, right before then, I believe the chief said uh, something to the effect of everyone wants to hold police accountable. Mm -hmm. We've been uh, responding to your reforms. Uh, we've been trying to reform, change what we do, but you need to hold the other parts of the system accountable. Uh, his frustration really seemed to be very apparent there. At one point, he called out the media. He said, yeah. you know, this would take uh, journalism, not reporting. And then he said, yeah, I took that shot, too. <laughs> he uh, <laughs> called, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. he uh, said, at one point, everyone knows how to do my job better than me, yeah. kind of yeah, in a joking again, manner. Yeah. You could sense his frustration yeah. really right. coming through. Yeah. Two quick things on this, just to wrap it up. One is, I guess the Chief's uh, weekly press conference is becoming must-see TV. It's online, and uh, a lot of yeah. people are tuning in now. It needs to be on Facebook Live. You never know what he's going to say going. next. It is. And the other thing, just <laughs> want to point out that although you pointed out that Eli and I, and I are both wearing the bracelets, we pose no threat to the public, <laughs> at least not well, at this listen, point. And, and I, let me just say this again. It's and I don't want to dumb it down with a bad analogy, but it's like your team is on a losing streak. We're, we're losing, yeah. and so all of a sudden you start looking for people to blame, and and you know the team is zero and eight, and and the coach starts to feel the pressure, and you know everybody's feeling the pressure, mm -hmm. and and he feels the pressure more than anyone, and that's I think what, what's yeah. happening here. But you know this is nothing new. I was just going to say for years covering the police beat, police have always said the jails are a revolving yeah. door, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 the judges mm -hmm. aren't tough enough. So yeah. this is just an extension right. of that. Yeah. Right. Well, we got to talk about gerrymandering because the Supreme Court brought that up this week and made a decision that surprised some people, but 
kind of closes the door for good on um, a lot of these arguments against gerrymandering. Um, the Supreme Court not saying it's right or it's wrong, just saying they don't have a dog in that fight, and if you want to make changes, you've got to do it legislatively. Let's talk about how it affects North Carolina first. Eli, you want to, do you want to start with this? Sure. This kind of um, puts a bow on the long-running case about North Carolina's congressional yeah. districts. Um, mm -hmm. The court basically said it's not our place to step in and change political gerrymanders. Mm -hmm. You know, they've said racial gerrymandering yes. is something you can't do. Mm -hmm. Of course, political gerrymandering can be a proxy for racial gerrymandering given party affiliations. Um, but now, you know, there's, I think, a lot more pressure on um, both parties for the 2020 election. Right. Since the court's not going to step in and support redrawing congressional districts, it's going to be um, the legislature after the 2020 census. And, right. you know, everybody's going to be fighting hard for every single seat because that's going to be a very, very consequential election now. As, uh, as the they always decade. have been. It's just what we, the difference now is that the courts will no, no longer be a factor. They're, they've taken themselves out of the arguments. Now it is truly up to the parties to do the best job they can to be in a position to, to control these these lines that where they're drawn in the well, future. It's just pure politics now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, so if your party is not in power, you think it's dirty pool the way the districts are drawn. If you are in power, you think it's just good billiards. Uh, so that's really, <laughs> the, 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 the court essentially said, look, uh, as Bob Rucho, who was uh, in the suit, told me yesterday, to the victor goes the spoils. You win, you get to draw the districts. And uh, and I, I was surprised by the decision. I felt like they would uh, come down on North Carolina, but yeah. essentially they said, nope, you win, have at it, draw your districts. Well, and I think the language, and I haven't read it specifically, but I think the Chief Justice said, you know, okay, it doesn't look fair, but it's not our... Yeah, mm -hmm. and not not, not our call. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, so it's interesting. I mean, you're right. At the in the end, I mean, it was sort of a declaration of the separation of powers, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that's that's legislative issue and not. Not, not a yeah, judicial. the original NC-12 was drawn by Democrats, and that was judged at That's the time right. as the worst district anyone had ever seen. Yeah. So it cuts both ways. And the other case that the, the judges, the, the, the justices uh, moved on, along with the Rucho case, was a case in Delaware where the Democrats were gerrymandering and the Republicans were suing them. So it cuts both ways. And again, it does kind of put the onus back on the parties to do their best job at the, at the election, so to make sure that they're in a position to do something beyond the elections when it comes to those future lines. You know, we're out of time. We didn't get a chance to talk about taxes for the arts, but uh, we will talk about that in It'll the future, I sense, in the next couple of weeks <laughs> the as the of taxation. county <laughs> commission decides whether or not to put that on the ballot uh, come November. In the meantime, uh, thank you for joining us this week. Again, if you want to join us anytime online, you can send your comments and questions to off the record at WTVI.org. Thank you for joining us on PBS Charlotte. Thank you also for being with us on Facebook Live, and we'll see you the next time on Off the Record. A production of PBS Charlotte.